at several verses as we always do. I'm reminded again the weakness of our flesh, the weakness of our uh, humanity, that the greatest thing we can do is hand somebody the Word of God. Um, I'm reminded of 1 Peter. This isn't the message, but I want to read it anyway. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. It says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The Word of God liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And this is the word which by the gospel is going to be preached unto you this morning. Thank you for being here. Those of you in this auditorium, those of you listening online, those of you listening later. Uh, I'm so thankful for the topic I'm going to preach on this morning. And uh, very simply, the title is Through Jesus' Blood. We sang, and I'm so glad we did, two songs this morning about the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And uh, I think of the song, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. There are those who would want to take the blood out of the Bible. They want to take the blood. They say it's a bloody religion. No, folks, we need to understand the blood was necessary for our salvation, the blood of Jesus Christ. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil of victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Through Jesus' blood. And we need to understand Jesus' blood isn't just any old blood. Jesus' blood isn't like our blood. We're sinful. We inherited a sin nature from Adam. The Bible says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. We all have a sin nature. And we have sinful blood. But there's one innocent blood. Judas recognized it. He said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. There's only one innocent blood, and who is that? That's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Literally, the blood of God. Sinless, pure, perfect blood. And uh, when people hear us sing about the blood, they may wonder if they don't understand the Word of God and the necessity of the shedding of blood for our sins to be forgiven. But I want to begin and... Uh, John chapter 1, and by no means will this be an exhaustive study because the blood, that crimson line, is all through the Bible. But I want to just notice the highlights, the purpose, uh, that what we have through Jesus' blood. We'll begin in John chapter 1, verse 29, a verse I quote often. A very interesting way for John to introduce Jesus to the world. Uh, when Jesus came, the Bible tells us that John came baptizing to introduce Jesus to the world. And when he introduced him, he did not introduce him perhaps in the way most people would have expected. Uh, they were looking for a Messiah, a King, a Christ, an anointed one. All mean the same, anointed one, Messiah, Christ. But when John introduced Jesus, he didn't say, behold, the Christ, the King, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Uh, Jesus came and performed some amazing miracles, but when Jesus came, John didn't say, Behold the, the miracle worker. Uh, he didn't say that. He very deliberately chose the way he introduced Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 29. It says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Lord, please speak to our hearts. Lord, use the frailness of my flesh, but the power of your spirit, the power of your word, to give us the truth this morning. Help me to preach what you want said, how you want it said. And Lord, I pray that if there be someone listening who is lost, 
someone listening who does not know for sure they're going to heaven, I pray that today will be the day of their salvation, that they'll understand the necessity of your blood being shed for us. And Father, just uh, get the glory and the honor in this message, in this meeting, in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Behold the Lamb of God. What, what would that possibly mean? Well, for 1,500 years, the children of Israel had been celebrating a feast called the Passover. It was the feast before the death angel passed over the land of Egypt. Moses told the children of Israel to get a lamb, a lamb that was without blemish. They were to keep that lamb in their homes. That lamb would literally almost become like a pet, a loved beloved animal in the home, but then they were to take that lamb and feel the pain of killing that lamb and shedding its blood. And then they were to eat of that lamb with herbs, and they were to take the blood of that lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and on the lintel, literally on the top and on the sides, a picture of the cross. They were to put that blood on the outside of the door, and when the death angel would pass over, when he would see the blood, he would pass over. If he didn't see the blood, the firstborn in that home would die. But when he saw the blood of the lamb, he would pass over and the lives would be spared. They'd be covered by the blood of the lamb. 1,500 years have passed and now Jesus, who is the Messiah, who is the Christ, but they didn't understand, he came to suffer first. He comes and John introduces him as the lamb of God. Now look at Matthew 26, please. Jesus is celebrating the Passover, that same exact feast. Uh, we call it the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, but they're in fact celebrating the Passover. The, the, the meal where they would have had a lamb and the lamb's blood would be shed. And as they're sitting there, this is something that's gone on for 1,500 years. Jesus says in Matthew Chapter 26, verse 26, it says, As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it. This was also part of this feast, matzah bread, unleavened bread. Bread without leaven. Leaven's a picture of sin. And there were th always three pieces of this bread. And they, they would take the center piece and they would actually break. There was a little game they would play in, in Jewish homes. They'd take that center piece and it would be broken and it would be wrapped in a linen napkin and hidden and the children could find it and they could win a prize. Just something fun, a tradition. But what they didn't understand was that all along that was picturing the middle person on the cross, Jesus Christ, and His body being broken. And this is what Jesus is preparing His disciples for. They didn't totally understand the price He's about to pay. And so, verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. What a remission. It's forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins. Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament, the New Covenant, and it's shed. Uh, and by the way, it's not spilled. We, there's a song in our books that says his blood was spilled. We changed that to say shed. Why? Because he purposefully gave his blood. He purposefully was the sacrifice for our sins. And he said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, for forgiveness. That's why he was introduced as the Lamb of God. Verse 29, he said, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Jesus foretold his death, but he also foretold his resurrection. He said, I'm coming to shed my blood so your sins can be forgiven. I'm going to give my body. My body will be broken for you, but I will rise again. Look at John chapter 19, if you would, please. John chapter 19. Jesus is arrested 
when they first came to arrest him, they asked if he was Jesus. He said, I am, even though under the names of God. And they all fell backwards. And uh, Pilate began to question Jesus, and he said, Don't you know I have power to crucify you? And Jesus said, You'd have no power except it were given me from above. You have no power except that which God has allowed you to have, Pilate. And uh, when Pilate began to question Jesus, he said, I find no fault in him. And you won't find fault in Jesus. He is the perfect, pure Son of God. But even though they found no fault in Jesus, it was so picturesque that they chose a thief, a a, a murderer, uh, Barabbas, to be traded for Jesus. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He, the guiltless, took the place of the guilty. And they traded Barabbas for Jesus, and Jesus was beaten and mocked and spit upon, and his beard plucked from his face, and a crown of thorns was beaten down into his brow, and he was nailed to that old rugged cross. And as every time that whip would hit his back, his blood would be shed, and every time the thorns were beaten into his brow, blood would come from those wounds. And we find in John chapter 19, notice, Verse 28, it says, After this, Jesus is hanging on the cross. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. And usually someone who was crucified would linger on the cross and they would push up to get a little air and fall back down, literally beating themselves against that cross. And the way they survived for any time was through their legs, just trying to get some air Verse 32, then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first. They break the legs of the thieves on either side of Jesus and of the other which was crucified with him. Verse 33, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Uh, Don't let folks tell you Jesus just swooned in the tomb. No, he was dead. He gave his life. Proof is positive that soldier who knew his trade, took that spear and jabbed it up into Jesus' side. And notice verse 34, And forthwith came there out blood and water. He shed his blood, he gave it all for our sins. Verse 35, And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the Scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him should not be broken. And again, another Scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. Go to John chapter 20 now, if you would. So Jesus has shed his blood. He's been introduced as the Lamb of God. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He shed his perfect, pure, sinless blood on that old rugged cross. But as he promised, he didn't just die for our sins. He was buried and He rose again. Now I want you to notice in John chapter 20, verse 11, Mary comes to the sepulcher looking for His body, looking to anoint His body. And notice John 20, verse 11, it says, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord. And I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Now notice what Jesus says in verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not. Now this is an interesting thing. Why would Jesus say, Touch me not? Uh, Later on, he appears to Thomas and he says, Thomas, take your hand and put it into my hands and put your hand into my side and be not faithless but believing. He told Thomas, touch him. Why does he tell Mary, Touch me not? 
Well, notice what he said. Jesus saying that her touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended unto the Father. What was Jesus doing ascending to the Father? I mean, this is before he ascends up before the disciples. He says, I, I haven't ascended to the Father. Touch me not. We'll go to Hebrews chapter 9. Not only is Jesus the Lamb, the Lamb of God, whose blood was shed to take away the sins of the world, but Jesus is also the high priest to offer that blood. In fact, He is the only one qualified to offer that blood. When you read through the Old Testament, some of it's very difficult reading. You read through Leviticus and Numbers and you read about sacrifices and, and offerings and all the things the priests had to do. And, and it almost seems like the priest wanted, this was often just a butcher. He just was constantly sacrificing animals and burning the fat and burning the blood. And, and what was the point of all of that? Well, when you read in the book of Hebrews, there was a point to all of that, and that was this, that one day one lamb would be offered. One lamb, sinless, pure, perfect blood, that lamb would offer his blood for once for all, for the sins of all mankind who've ever lived. And in Hebrews chapter 9, I want you to notice uh, verse number 6, there's, there's a time called the Day of Atonement. The high priest would enter one time a year. Only the high priest could enter. It was behind the veil. It was called the Holy of Holies. It was representative of the presence of God. And there was inside that veil a place called the mercy seat, and underneath the mercy seat was the broken law of God. And the priest had to enter one time a year. He had to go through some purification processes, some rituals, and bring that blood inside the mercy seat. On the bottom of the priest's robe, there was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. So when the priest would move, you'd hear him moving. And they would tie a rope on the priest's leg so that if he walked into God's presence and he wasn't properly purified and God smote him dead because of that improper purification, they could pull him out. No one could approach. No one could approach God because of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. But symbolically, one time a year, that priest would enter with that blood. He'd sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. The mercy seat was the lid. And so literally it showed how that when God looked down at the, His broken law, what He saw was His blood, that blood of that animal covering the broken law. But that blood of an animal could never cover sin. Never. And that's why Hebrews 9 tells us what it does in verse 6. It says, Now when these things were thus ordained. In other words, all these sacrifices and the tab tabernacle, the temple. When these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, he's talking about the Holy of Holies, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, the place where only the high priest could enter. Into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood. He had to have blood. He had to have blood that had been shed to offer symbolically upon that, uh, that mercy seat. Notice, which he offered for himself. Why did he offer it for himself? Because that priest was a sinner, just like we all are sinners. And for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all, literally the very presence of God, was not yet made manifest. That blood of bulls and goats couldn't get people into the presence of God. Notice, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present. In other words, that was a picture of a literal mercy seat. Don't miss this. This is a picture of a literal mercy seat where blood had to be offered. Now again, if that high priest went to enter and offer that blood on the mercy seat, and someone touched him, that blood was defiled. That blood was no longer pure and holy. And I want to remind you what Jesus said to Mary. He said, Mary, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended unto my Father. You say, what did Jesus do when He had risen from the dead? 
Folks, again, there are some who would say the blood of Jesus, there was nothing special about it. It just ran down into the ground. That's not at all what God's Word teaches. What God's Word teaches is that Jesus' pure, perfect, sinless blood was offered literally in the presence of God for us. So when God looks at us, He does not see His broken law. He does not see our sin. What He sees is the blood, the perfect, pure, sinless blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. You'll notice verse 11, Hebrews 9, not only was Christ the Lamb, but He's the high priest. Verse 11 says, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Not, not this tabernacle down here. That is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood. He entered in once into the holy place. Where's that holy place? In heaven, before God Himself having obtained eternal redemption for us. Look down in chapter 9, verse 22. It says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. There can be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Whose blood had to be shed? The perfect Lamb of God. Verse 23, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens, in other words, the literal mercy seat in heaven, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things, uh, I'm sorry, the pattern, the, the earthly uh, patterns, they, they are just simply pictures of the heavenly uh, reality of the mercy seat. Notice, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Could, could someone walk into the presence of God with money and pay for the price of our sins? No. Could somebody walk into the presence of God with religion or baptism or, the, or uh, works uh, or the blood of an animal and pay the price for our sin. No, there had to be a better sacrifice. What is that better sacrifice? Notice verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. The ones on this earth are just pictures of the true mercy seat. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Why did He say, Mary, touch me not? Because He was going to offer His perfect, pure sinless blood on that mercy seat. Verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. Why don't we have a crucifix with Jesus hanging on a cross? Because he's not offered often. He's off the cross. He was offered once for all, died, buried, rose again. Notice verse 26, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You know, there's, there's nothing you could do to offer God that would impress God enough to wash away your sins. Nothing. Nothing any man could ever do to impress a holy God. But Jesus appeared by the sacrifice of himself to put away our sin. Verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for Him shall He appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I want to look very quickly. We have, a, we have a few minutes left. I want to look at what do I have through Jesus' blood. Again, there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Uh, some have said, well, Jesus could have been stoned and paid the price for our sins. He could have been stoned to death. No. He had to shed His blood as the Lamb of God. He had to give His blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sins. And so, number one, I am forgiven through the blood of Jesus. I'm forgiven. I have a, a railroad spike in my office with a, the plate that says forgiven. It just is a reminder to me that I'm forgiven. Every sin of my life has been forgiven. How? Through the blood of the Lamb of God Jesus Christ. Number two, I am debt free because of the blood of Jesus. Look at Romans 3. We're going to look at a few verses here. I am debt free. I don't owe a sin debt anymore because Jesus paid it. His blood satisfied my debt of sin. And oh, what a rest that is to understand the true gospel, to understand that salvation is not through your works, to understand that salvation is not through any effort you can make 
We don't have enough effort to impress a holy God. Salvation is purely offered through a forgiveness through the blood of Jesus, and our debt is paid through the blood of Jesus. Notice Romans 3, verse 22, if you would, it says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. It had to be that simple because there's no other way we could obtain it. Through those that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We could never measure up in our works. We could never measure up in our deeds to impress a holy God. Verse 24, being justified freely, I love that word freely, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. What's propitiation? It literally means God's wrath is satisfied. It means the debt satisfied. It means I don't owe a debt. I, I owed a sin debt. I, I, I owed a debt I could not pay. Jesus paid a debt He did not owe. And when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I put my faith in His blood. My sin debt was satisfied. I am debt free. Jesus is the propitiation, the satisfaction for me. The bill is paid. It's paid in full. Uh, verse 25 says, To declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. You can't brag. If you're saved, you get to heaven, you can't brag saying, well, I, I earned it, I, I worked my way, well, I, I adjusted my life in such a way. No, no. No, it's only through the blood of Jesus. So number one, I'm forgiven through the blood of Jesus. Number two, I am debt-free through the blood of Jesus. Number three, I am justified through the blood of Jesus. Look at Romans 5. I'm justified. I, I'm not just as if I never sinned. I'm just as if I were never even a sinner. How is that possible for a son of Adam, a daughter of Eve, to be that way through the blood of Jesus? Uh, I'm justified. Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, no ability to save ourselves, no ability to impress a holy God, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but how many are righteous? None. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. How many are good? Romans 3, 12, There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Verse 8, but God commendeth His love toward us. He proved it. He demonstrated it. In that while we were yet sinners, we had nothing to offer God. Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, but Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. I am literally justified. I'm just as if I were never a sinner. I'm right with God. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus covering my sin. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Notice next, number four, I am atoned for, or here's how you could say it, I'm covered. I'm covered. Now, if you ever go to a restaurant, somebody takes you to eat and they they say, hey, it's covered. It's paid. What does that mean? They took care of the bill. I'm covered under the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not fair. Exactly, it's not fair. He suffered and I received salvation. Uh, say, it's not fair. I ought to have to do something. He did it all. He did it all. And that's why salvation, we have nothing to boast in. We can only glory in Him. When we get to heaven, it will be nothing but glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what he says in verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And again, atonement literally means to cover over our sins. It's like that mercy seat, the day of atonement, where the blood was shed and put on that mercy seat and covered the broken law of God and covered our sin. I am, I am covered through the blood of Jesus Christ. Number five. Number five, I am redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed 
by the blood of the Lamb. What does it mean to be redeemed? It means to be bought back. We were lost to sin and Satan and death and hell, but Jesus bought us back. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter 1, if you would, please. Redeemed, such an important word to understand in the Bible, bought back. Ephesians 1, look at verse 3. And again, don't, don't change the Bible. Don't take verses, don't take words out of the Bible. Uh, the Bible makes it clear in Ephesians 1, 7 that we are redeemed, we have redemption through His blood. There, there are books that want to take that out. Don't take it out, it belongs there. Ephesians 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. In Acts chapter 20, it, the Bible says, the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. I'm, I'm part of the church of God. I'm part of the family of God. Why? Because He purchased me. He bought me. He bought you, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, with His own blood. 1 Peter chapter 1 Verse 18, in fact, let's just turn and look at it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. We're redeemed, not with corruptible things. We're not bought back to God by our religion. We're not bought back to God by works, by baptism, uh, by rituals. No, we're bought back to God by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 18 says, For as much as ye know, Ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you who by Him do believe in God that raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. I am redeemed, I am redeemed through the blood of Jesus. Number six, I'm made nigh. Look at Ephesians 2, 11. I'm made nigh. What does that mean? It means I'm brought close. As we already read in Ephesians 1, I'm accepted in the beloved. I don't need to worry. Jesus is a friend of sinners, but it wasn't enough just to be a friend of sinners. His blood had to be shed for sinners so that we could be accepted in, in the beloved. Uh, not everyone is saved, and mankind is lost because they have not applied the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, because they have not trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. He has done everything necessary for salvation. He wants you to be saved. He loves you. But if you do not trust Him and Him alone, if you trust your works, if you trust your religion, you're lost, and you need to trust the Lord Jesus alone. And notice, I am made nigh to God. How, how can a man be close to God? How could... A sinful man be close to God. We're made nigh, we're brought close, we're accepted through the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 2.11, it says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ. What's he saying? There was a day when those of physical Israel thought that everybody else was far off. They could not be part of the people of God. But notice what he says. At that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And notice, it doesn't matter who you are, red, yellow, black, white, what nation you're from, what nation you aren't from. The only way to God is through the Lord Jesus Christ, through His shed blood. You, you can't trust your biology, your DNA, your background, your education. That doesn't give you any standing with God. Your religion doesn't give you any standing with God. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice Ephesians 2.19, it says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being made, being the chief cornerstone. 
Number seven, I am cleansed of all my sin through the blood of Jesus. Look at 1 John chapter 1. I'm cleansed of all my sin. All my sin through the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1. Notice verse 7, it says, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And don't, don't just pass over these words. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. By the way, for those who would think they could stand before God without that blood covering their sin, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. I am cleansed of all my sin through the blood of Jesus. And then last of all, look at 1 John 3 and then we'll go to Revelation. But last of all, I'm a child of God. I am a child of God and I'm a joint heir with Christ through Jesus' blood. Through Jesus' blood. There's no other way. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Again, for those who believe you could lose your salvation, I, I want to ask you, what kind of father would he be who would make you his child and then forsake you? Uh, we're given the Holy Spirit who is a comforter. What kind of comfort would he be if he seals us and then forsakes us? And we need a Savior. What kind of Savior would He be if He were able to save us for part of our sin or part of our lives, but then He could not finish the deal? No, folks, we are right now, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are right now a child of God, and you are forever a child of God. The DNA is there. You're born again into the family of God. And notice what it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. I'm not becoming a son of God. I'm already a son of God. I'm already a child of God. I'm already washed in His blood. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. I I'm, not, I'm not what I'm going to be. But one day I'm going to be like Him. Those of you who are saved, you're going to be like Him. Notice, we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. We're going to be like Him. We're going to see Him as He is. What a wonderful day that will be. And notice Revelation 1, verse 5. Again, I'm a child of God and a joint heir with Christ. Not only do I have salvation, I'm not going to hell because of the blood of Christ but I have heaven promise. And not only do I have heaven promise, but I'm a joint heir with Christ. Whatever Christ gets, I get. Could you ever deserve that? Could you ever possibly? No, we never could. Only through the blood of Christ. Notice Revelation 1, verse 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, what was his motivation for shedding his blood? Here it is. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look at Revelation 5, verse 9 through 13. Revelation 5, verse 9. And notice, if you look at verse 8, they've fallen down before whom? Before the Lamb. For the Lamb, the one who is slain uh, for our sins. And notice what he said, they sing, verse 9, and will be singing. Verse 9, they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. Is there anyone worthy than Jesus? No, there's no one else who's worthy. Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Not only did He redeem us, but He made us. We're His children. We have joint, we're joint heirs with Christ. Verse 11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven 
and on the earth and under the earth. That's us included. That's all the animals, all the creatures. And such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Through Jesus' blood, I'm forgiven. Through Jesus' blood, I am debt free. Through Jesus' blood, I am justified. Through Jesus' blood, I am covered. Through Jesus' blood, I'm redeemed. Through Jesus' blood, I'm made nigh to God. Through Jesus' blood, I'm cleansed of all my sin. And through Jesus' blood, I am a child of God. And I'm a joint heir with Christ. And I'll read this and I'll be done. Our bodies have a transportation system so complex and complete that it dwarfs that of a metropolis. The body's transportation system cuts through every tissue and organ by means of a network of 60,000 miles of blood vessels. No cell of your body lies more than a hair's breadth from a blood capillary. The center of this vast system is a pump the size of an apple or a fist, your heart, that pumps 2,000 gallons of blood through its chambers every day, sending blood to every part of the body. The blood carries vital, life-giving oxygen and nutrients to every cell in the body. The body has 25 trillion red blood cells, which are like little UPS trucks carrying all sorts of packages such as oxygen that are needed by the cells in the body. Every cell in the body requires oxygen to remain alive. If the blood is cut off to any part of the body, it deprives that part of the body of oxygen, and that bodily part will die. The brain is deprived of oxygen, the brain dies, and the body dies. The white blood cells, meanwhile, are like billions of little tanks protecting the body. There are five different kinds of these white blood cells, and each one is trained to go after a different enemy. One drop of blood can contain anywhere from 7,000 to 25,000 white blood cells, and the number of them increases when our body is fighting an illness, just like calling up the reserves. As far as our skeletal structure is concerned, our bones do double duty. Not only do they support the body and keep us upright, but they're hollow. On the inside of these bones are marvelous little factories that operate day and night, producing these billions of little trucks and tanks, these white and red blood cells. The brain oversees the entire operation, and the heart keeps it functioning. 3,500 years ago, in the Word of God, God told us the life is in the blood. And when Jesus Christ died, the life-giving blood drained from His body, providing forgiveness and life to all who believe. Let's bow our heads together, please. The life is in the blood. And through Jesus' blood alone, we can be forgiven. Through Jesus' blood, you can be debt-free. Through Jesus' blood, you can be just as if you were never even a sinner. Through Jesus' blood, you can be covered. Through Jesus' blood, you can be redeemed. Through Jesus' blood, you can be made nigh, brought close to a holy God. Through Jesus' blood... You can be cleansed of all your sin. Through Jesus' blood, you can be a child of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Salvation is so simple because Jesus did the hard part and shed His blood and paid the price. And what must we do to be saved? Well, God made it as easy as possible. He made it as simple as possible because we could not save ourselves. We could not pay the price for our sin, so... He paid the price and He simply says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What does it mean to believe on Him? It means to fully trust, depend, rely upon Him and Him alone. Salvation is that simple. Aren't you tired of trying to work your way to heaven? It'll never work. Aren't you tired of trying to impress a holy God with your religion, your life? It'll never work. The perfect, pure blood of Jesus is the only thing that impresses a holy God, a sacrifice Jesus made. And if you'll rest in that today, you'll trust Him and Him alone, He'll save you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Who would say, Pastor, I am concerned about my soul. I am not 100% sure I'm saved, but I want to be today. I want to trust Christ and Christ alone. Please pray for me. If that's you, would you lift your hand? I need to be saved this morning.
Just lift your hand up if that's you. I know I'm a sinner. I know Christ paid the price for me. And I want to be saved. Lift your hand now if that's you, anyone at all. Our heads are still bowed. Our eyes are still closed. Who would say, Pastor, I am saved through the blood of Jesus. I am forgiven. I'm redeemed. I'm covered. I'm one with Christ because of the price He paid. I'm, I'm not trusting my works. I'm not trusting my goodness, my religion. I've trusted Jesus and Him alone. And I know I'm saved because of Him. If that's you, would you lift your hand? Would you just thank the Lord for saving you? It may be you're listening online. You need to trust Christ today. I encourage you to do so. And believer, can I encourage you to take this simple gospel message? Uh, there's something that the devil likes to do. He likes to complicate the gospel, make it difficult, make it hard. Jesus made it easy. He paid the price. He did the hard part by shedding his blood. Take that good news to a soul who's lost, a sinner who's dying, who needs salvation. Give them that life-saving blood transfusion of the Son of God. Would you ask the Lord to use you this week to be a witness? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that through your blood we're saved. Through your blood we're brought nigh. Through your blood we're redeemed. All these things that we've seen today. Thank you. And Lord, thank you for each and every person here today. Thank you for giving us the strength to be here. And Lord, we lift up the rest of our church family. We ask you to bring them back to us safely. And uh, Lord, for those who are uh, battling grief and illness, those who've lost loved ones this week, we ask you to comfort them. Thank you, Lord, though, that you've prepared a place for us. This world's not our home. Uh, it's just a temporary place. So Lord, help us to be busy getting the good news of the gospel to those around us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing.